Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of Refugee Nights, a virtual festival from Imperial War Museums that explores different aspects of the refugee experience throughout history and celebrates their contribution to our society. In last week's episode, we looked at the perilous journeys across the world that refugees have been forced to make. We asked how refugees survive, cope, and create a sense of normality whilst constantly on the move and navigating the harsh realities of a refugee camp. And we examined how these journeys have changed throughout history, from the kindred transport to the channel crossings today. If you missed it, you can watch episodes one and two on the link below or on our YouTube channel. In this week's episode, broadcast from the Imperial War Museum in London, we will be looking at the challenges that refugees throughout history have faced when trying to forge new lives in new countries. We also ask one of the most pressing questions of our time. What can the world do now to help refugees? This series was made possible thanks to our sponsors, McFarland, and our partners, AHRC and ESRC. It was developed in collaboration with the Disasters and Emergencies Committee the International Organization of Migration and English Pen. Our media partner for this series is CNN. My name is Hassan Akkad. I am a photographer and a documentary filmmaker. Um, I was one of the people who helped make the BBC documentary series Exodus Our Journey to Europe, which you may have seen in 2017. Before I was a filmmaker, I was an English teacher back home in Damascus, where I'm from, in Syria. When Syria which started as a peaceful revolution against the dictatorship, became a civil war and then turned into a proxy war, there was no reason, I mean, I did not see a solution in the horizon. And the decision to, 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 to leave to Europe did not come easily. I, it was my only option. So after I claimed asylum in, in Heathrow, and uh, after my first screening, I was, um, I was officially an asylum seeker. And as an asylum seeker, I'm entitled for five pounds a day. That's, that's what asylum seekers get in Britain. For some reason, my five pounds that it didn't go through, and uh, I um, ended up staying um, uh, at um, my friend's house in, uh, in Hertfordshire, in Hitchin, uh, for three months on her couch. And because asylum seekers are not allowed to work as well, unfortunately, I um, started volunteering at an Oxfam charity shop. Um, after three months, I left her house and I went to London where I was couch surfing with other friends just waiting for my asylum uh, claim to get processed. Um, and I managed to do a lot of talks. I would go to pubs and churches and mosques and universities and schools and do talks about Syria and, and my journey and just uh, hoping to put a face on the crisis, which was at, at, at its peak back then. Um, after six months, my asylum claim was processed and I was granted leave to remain. Um, and due to a hierarchy in the refugee world, my, my, my case didn't take long because people from other countries take over a year or two in some cases, or even three to, to, to get their leave to remain. After arriving here, um, my mental health was not great because everything resurfaced and I was diagnosed with complex PTSD, and I had, uh, I don't know, it was, hard to, it, was, <laughs> it was hard to process things and accept the reality of living in exile. Um, whole new world, which is strange and very different to, to, to Syria. And uh, so it took me a while to, to adapt, get a job, and build new friendships, and get used to, 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 to this new world that I'm living in. What helped me settle in is the ability to, to replicate home here. And home is having somewhere to stay and having friends and falling in love and uh, having a community. And in the past five years, I managed to do this. So um, it really helped me integrate. It helped me fit in the society. And it helped me also contribute in, in my own way. I started working back as a photographer because a very kind photographer whose name is Greg gave me a camera as a gift and he asked me, he said, start over again. And that's what people need mostly. They need an opportunity, not to, they don't need uh, pity. They need an opportunity. And um, I started working as a photographer again. I started working 
in documentary filmmaking, and the film I helped make won a BAFTA, which was very surreal, jumping from a dinghy to a, to a stage, accepting a BAFTA in 20 months was something that I did not expect that would happen. And um, I still work in advocacy, and uh, um, I work with my friends at Choose Love Help Refugees in terms of advocacy and shedding light on the refugee crisis and, and uh, speaking up um, when it comes to these issues. And uh, during the pandemic, in the first peak, I signed up to work as a cleaner in my local hospital, um, which I did for two months. And um, now I am working on my, I'm co-directing a documentary film about the pandemic. And um, I wish to go back home one day. It's, uh, I think about it all the time. The, 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 London has been great, but uh, Damascus is, is, is homeland. And um, I would definitely go back in a heartbeat if it's safe to do so. Um, because currently I can't, because uh, the reasons why I left Syria are still there. And um, if I go back, my life will be in danger. Um, so I think I'm going to stay until it's safe to go back home. So after I was granted asylum, I was granted leave to remain. And leave to remain is a five-year residency. Um, I'm still on my leave to remain. And when that expires, I have to apply for indefinite leave to remain. Um, and hopefully, if that goes through, um, it'll be great because I can, um, I'll be less anxious about my stay in the UK. After a year from, from being granted indefinite leave to remain, I can apply for citizenship. So I can be British, and I will celebrate by eating uh, bean on toast and uh, marmite. Um, yeah. <laughs> Next, we have a brief explore of refugees forced to flee, a new exhibition at IWM London, which examines a century of refugee experiences, from the kindred transport to the Calais jungle. Museum creator Simon Offord is going to tell us about one of the exhibition's highlights. Hi, Simon. Hello. One of the themes we wanted to explore in this exhibition was how people settled in a new country, how they were received, and how it made them confront their identity. So Manfred Moses was um, born in Alsfeld in Germany into an Orthodox Jewish family. Uh, on his 13th birthday in uh, September 1935, he celebrated his bar mitzvah. Now, as an only child, this was a huge celebration for the family. But what would normally have been a lavish affair had to be scaled back because of the Nazis and the restrictions placed upon Jewish families. In fact, the Nuremberg laws that further restricted the rights of Jewish people and others came into effect that same month. For his bar mitzvah, his mother embroidered this uh, velvet bag, which contained teflin, or phylacteries, that he would use in his prayers. After the November pogrom of uh, 1938, also known as Kristallnacht, he conducted Shabbat services in the houses of friends because the uh, synagogues had been destroyed. Mm. But shortly afterwards, he was arrested, aged only 16, and sent to Buchenwald concentration camp. Luckily, he was released after a short time, but he decided that he could no longer live in Germany. And so he came to the UK, where he got a job in a zip fastener factory in London. His parents obviously couldn't come with him. And this bag was one of the few things that he was able to bring when he came to this country. In September 1939, and the outbreak of the Second World War, Manfred, along with thousands of others from Germany and Austria, had to go before tribunals because they were now seen as enemy aliens. Manfred was clearly a refugee from Nazi aggression, so he passed his tribunal. But in June 1940, in the fall of France, there was a cry of intern the lot, and he was taken into custody. Interned first in Surrey, and then in Wiltshire, and finally in Douglas on the Isle of Man. Uh, despite his company uh, requesting that he be released, he decided on his 18th birthday to join the British Army, which was one of the ways that internees could uh, leave the internment camps. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, he was sent to the Pioneer Corps, which at the time was the only unit he'd be able to join. But through training, hard work and tough trade exams, he became an instrument mechanic and rose to the rank of Staff Sergeant in the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. In 1942, he received word from the Red Cross that his parents had been transported. His aunt Silly had already been sent to a concentration camp. They never returned. In September that year, he went to the Leeds Synagogue for Yom Kippur. But he says he could not come to terms with the many prayers containing the phrase, merciful God, contrasting as it did with what he saw as the horrible reality. So he left the synagogue and never returned again for prayer. In 1943, the Army Council stated that anyone with an obviously German or Jewish name had to change it and get a new pay book just in case they were ever captured by the enemy. With the name like Manfred Moses, yeah. he understandably changed it and he became Michael Maynard, which is the name he would use for the rest of his life. After serving with the British Army, in Europe from 1944. He was eventually demobbed in 1947. Not wanting to go back to Germany and having nothing to go back for, he became a naturalised British citizen. In 1951 he got married and he left his Stoke Newington lodgings for a new life in Bayswater. But this bag, now a painful reminder of everything that he'd lost, mm. he left behind and it was actually donated to the museum by the family he was lodging with. Oh, wow. Because of war and persecution, Manfred, now Michael, had lost his home, his family, his country, his language, his religion, and even his name. So he started again from scratch in a new country. Next, we meet Imad al -Arnab a Syrian chef and restaurateur who also happens to be a very good friend of mine. Aymad shares his story of arriving in the UK and the important role food and cooking played in his new life here. Let's watch him at work in his kitchen preparing a delicious Syrian dish. Hello, my name is Aymad al -Arna. I'm a Syrian chef and restaurateur. I'm the founder of uh, Imad Syrian Kitchen. Before the war, life in Syria was perfect to build a new business. Um, I started my first restaurant in 1999 and we had the third and biggest one in 2009. arriving to the UK, I stayed on the steps of church for 64 days um, and um, I had like a small corner kitchen over there cooking to the other refugee, to the uh, nice volunteers from everywhere. It was really good time, um, but really, really hard time as well. I wanted to, to be a restaurant from the very beginning. I always wanted to be a chef. And it's not something like seasonal or, or fashionable, or maybe this is something for life. It's something for generations, something will, will never end. It wasn't really hard to build a new life in the UK because I can see myself fitting in very well in London. I'm not looking any stranger than anyone else in the street. I'm very lucky from the first place and uh, I'm always surrounded by angels. I'm lucky, I'm working with food and in restaurants. I think people appreciate what we do more than anything else, like they appreciate the nice taste of your food when they get into your restaurant or uh, into your pop-up. So it, it wasn't really hard for me to fit in. I've met uh, a lot of uh, interesting people through. If we can call it the food community in London is really interested, 
Yeah, they are like my best friends. So I had my first pop-up restaurant in London, March 2017. I think it's really, really important to have um, a pop-up for anything you want to do uh, in future, just because, especially for someone coming from, from overseas like me, first of all, to understand the market, to understand the... Uh, view of the customers to to be to build their relationships i didn't have even instagram in in, in damascus so it's really um, my first pop-up restaurant in london it was for me to understand what it is the market of london what 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 it's need what it's gonna take how i can start and surprisingly it was really really successful I wasn't accepted to be that successful. Finding the right location was really hard. And then convincing other people that this refugee can be trust with your with your property or your uh, your restaurant. To, to, to start building something really good. It's not enough for them to have great career or uh, great test, or even if you have like really huge number of followers, it doesn't really concern them. What it's really important for them is uh, how much in your bank account. So this is what's really, really difficult for me. But yeah, finally we had the great location. I love what we did in, in our last few pop-ups. Imagine a kitchen as a restaurant will be much, much better and it will be next level just because I will cook for the first time in my own kitchen instead of cooking in someone else's kitchen. There's no surprises. It will be good. It will be 100% what I wanted, what, what I want you to feel from, from our Syrian food. Particular spices remind me at home like um, I love this difference between the smell of cumin seeds and grounded uh, cumin between the dry mint and the fresh mint dry parsley is something amazing we use it in, in our cuisine I do miss uh, my family Friday morning uh, breakfast so I come from really really large family but Friday morning for us was really, really important where all of this family gathering together. And, and honestly, I, like, I don't have it here in the UK. I introduce you a new uh, recipe of mine. It's, uh, it's called uh, Zahra bin Kizbara. It's a signature new dish. Hopefully you're gonna like it. It's very easy recipe and very uh, easy ingredient, you can find it in everyone's kitchen, so hopefully you're going to enjoy it. We are now going to see a discussion chaired by CNN's Clarissa Ward. In previous years, the world has experienced waves of migration unlike anything we've witnessed since the Second World War. 
So how should the world respond to this seemingly insurmountable problem? Stay tuned and find out. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this important panel, Time for Action, How Can the World Help Refugees? My name is Clarissa Ward. I'm CNN's Chief International Correspondent, and I can tell you that I have spent much of the past few years doing stories on this epic wave of migration, which frankly is unlike anything we've seen since the Second World War. Almost 80 million people around the world have been forced to flee their homes. Nearly 30 million are refugees. Over half of that 30 million are under the age of 18, and far too many of them are being denied the basic human rights of education, healthcare, employment, freedom of movement. So how on earth should the world be responding to this seemingly insurmountable problem? That is the topic that we are here today to discuss, and we have an incredible panel to discuss it with. Um, let me just introduce them all, and then we will begin our conversation. Uh, we're lucky to be joined by Alexander Betts, who is Professor of Forced Migration and International Affairs at Oxford University. We're also privileged to be joined by Danny Skriskandaraja, the Chief Executive of Oxfam Great Britain, and Maya Goodfellow, the author of Hostile Environment, How Immigrants Became Scapegoats, who is based at Sheffield University. And what I thought we'd do to start is, I'm basically gonna give each of you two minutes to answer the same question. And perhaps we'll start with Alexander. What does it mean in this day and age to actually help refugees? We have to recognize that we live in an age of displacement. We have more people displaced around the world than at any time since the Second World War. But we also have to get a sense of perspective and realize that the majority of those displaced people are internally displaced and haven't crossed an international border. And it's around 25 million who have crossed the border as refugees. But we also need to understand that most of those, about 85% are hosted in low and middle income countries. So they're not in Europe, they're not in North America. The numbers coming to Europe and the rich world are actually relatively small, but they're important. It becomes very important that when people flee conflict or persecution, they can flee to safety. They can cross a border to get access to their most fundamental rights. And we have an international refugee system backed by international law that is designed to ensure that when people flee, they have protection, that all nation states around the world, all countries have a duty to ensure that when someone flees violence or an authoritarian government, they have somewhere safe they can go. And so the key way to help refugees is to admit them onto the territory of the country, to ensure that when they're there, they're protected and not forced back to a country where they're not going to be safe. And so the key thing that we have as a responsibility as citizens is to uphold that right to ensure that everyone understands that refugees have those particular needs, that they can't be sent back to the dangerous countries that they come from, like Syria, Venezuela, war-torn societies. We have to protect them. And so talking about it, telling people that, recognizing the history of why we've protected refugees, those who fled Nazi Germany, those who fled communist regimes, and why we continue to need to do that. That is an important part of ensuring that we hold our governments to account to maintain those basic rights. Uh, Maya, I can see you sort of nodding your head a lot as you're listening to what Alexander is saying. I wonder, do you have, what would you add to that or how would you expand on that? Um, yeah, so I suppose I, I agree with significant parts of that, but being um, maybe an awkward academic, I suppose I would question the question. And I think we need to really break it down because I think this, when we're talking about helping people, this, uh, there's a number of different factors that sort of at play, not least if we're thinking about where in the world we're talking about. So as Alexander sort of suggested, this is is multifaceted and um, I primarily work on think, thinking about the UK and Europe so I think that's in a lot of ways limited but that's what I'm going to speak a bit to and I think when we're conceptualizing help I would probably reject what might be seen as sort of paternalistic arguments about helping people that sort of in, infantilizes them or strips them of their humanity or their agency um, and that is part of the reason for talking about that is because at times the debate, particularly in countries like the UK, sort of takes on that tone. And I think um, we could probably begin to break this down into two sort of 
separate but over, uh, overlapping categories when we're thinking about helping people or working with people in order to secure the outcomes that they want. Um, and I think part of this is really un shifting how we understand asylum and movement and not continuing to problematize it as a lot of our political debate does. And so firstly, I think we need to really engage with why people are moving, the very, very complex reasons that people are forced to seek asylum. Um, and that includes thinking about how countries like the UK can be implicated in some of the reasons why people move, whether we're talking about conflict or whether we're thinking about um, global poverty, um, which obviously isn't covered in the Refugee Convention in the way that maybe we would we can talk about a bit later on. But the other thing that I think really needs to be done is challenging an existing challenging existing policy that is stigmatizing. So not only the policies that make it difficult for people to move across borders, but also the policies that meet them when they arrive in countries like the UK. So we have an incredibly punitive asylum system here in the UK. So that means looking at um, why it's so difficult to prove your, that you are eligible to um, be a refugee, you know, this whole discourse around genuine refugees, but also the sorts of, the very limited state support that is there for people whilst they're waiting on their asylum applications. And so I think in terms of helping people, it really is interrogating the existing system and the, the, the punitive nature of large parts of that. So Danny, obviously Alexander and Maya are coming at this from an academic perspective, from your perch, um, what are some of the more practical, uh, I guess, steps when we talk about help or helping refugees? And from the purpose of, perspective of your organization, particularly Oxfam, how are you practically looking at improving this situation? Thanks, Clarissa. Look, yeah, I think there are some really important things that we have to do for as long as there are people, tens of millions of people who are being forcibly displaced. And, for us at Oxfam, that a lot of that is about providing the very basic services to people who are fleeing. You know, when a million people fled from Myanmar into Bangladesh and went into, you know, the world's sort of most insecure conditions, I think organizations like ours feel the responsibility that we have to be there to provide them with clean water, with food, with basic protection. And it is a tragedy that this still happens, but I think there is this urgent need to provide for those people. But you know that's not enough. I mean, one of the experiences at, at Oxfam for the you know ever since we were founded in 1942 is that it's not enough just to treat the symptoms, to put you know to apply the band aids. We have to get, as as Meyer and Alexander have said, to the root causes. Why is it that? conflict, insecurity, pol political persecution can, and climate breakdown increasingly is driving people to move from their home. And, and we have to go to those, uh, those structures, as well as, of course, changing the narratives by which we think about these issues. I mean, for mm. me, the right to seek refuge is, you know, in some ways, the most fundamental human right, because all of our other human rights, we rely on, on others, the state in particular, to provide or protect. But this is the one right that we have when that very state turns against us or other forces turn against us. It's such a precious uh, right, and yet it's such a tragedy that when we talk about this fundamental human right, it's often in such negative, dehumanizing ways. And so we have to provide the practical help, we have to tackle the systemic drivers of why people move, and we have to change the way that we talk about uh, the notion of refugees. Yeah, it's interesting you say that, Danny, because this is something I deal with a lot as a journalist, is trying to explain to people, particularly in the West, that no one chooses to leave their home in Aleppo and this beautiful city and their friends and their family and this wonderful, vibrant community and rich history and culture to go and live in, you know, Bognor Regis or whatever it is. They don't choose to do this because they're trying to milk the system or, or, or game, you know, the system. They do it because there's nothing left. There's absolutely nothing, and the only hope they have for a better future is to make that kind of a, a sacrifice, frankly. And I think something is really misunderstood um, by many people in terms of the attitude towards refugees. But Alexander, I wonder if we could just take a step back, okay, and think about how we got here. And I just, can you give us a sense of how the asylum system has evolved since the Second World War? Well, we've had norms of people fleeing from conflict or persecuting regimes um, and having the right to seek asylum for a very long time. For as long as there have been nation states, there's been a need for people to flee. So we saw as, as early as um, the sort of 17th and 18th centuries, people in Europe fleeing on the basis of their religion, Protestants in Europe fleeing from France to Britain, the so-called Huguenots. 
And really over time, norms emerged in Europe, standards, where we should protect people fleeing that kind of persecution based on religion. But it was only really with the 20th century that we had the codification of that, agreements between nation states, that there was a shared commitment to protect people fleeing certain sets of circumstances. And in the aftermath of the Second World War, there was a particular recognition, a never again moment, when Europe had witnessed millions of people fleeing Nazi Germany and the atrocious inhumane conditions that had been created under that regime. And at the same time, with the formation of the Soviet Union and the start of the Cold War and communism, we saw people moving from east to west. And so it was against that backdrop that nation states came together, particularly in Europe, and said, we need to create an agreement among states, the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees. And the core of that convention is very simple. It defines who a refugee is and the rights to which they should be entitled. So Article 1 of that convention says a refugee is someone fleeing a well-founded fear of persecution based on race, religion, nationality, membership of a social group or political opinion. And because they're outside their country and they've been treated because of who they are as a person, they have a right to cross a border. And they have a right to certain things, not to be returned to where they've come from, to persecution, and to receive their full spectrum of civil and political rights and socioeconomic rights, including the right to work, the right to earn a living, the right to set up a business, own property. Now, that regime was created at a very particular moment of history, post Second World War Europe. And its drafters were clever. They said, okay, circumstances are gonna adapt over time. The way we interpret that convention and the definition of a refugee will need to change. We recognize that. But the challenge over time has become that refugees are not primarily a European phenomenon, that as we've seen more movements in Africa, or in Asia, or in Latin America, that regime created for post-war Europe has had to adjust. And not all people fleeing desperate circumstances now fit that definition. Many flee climate change, as Danny said. Many flee fragile and failed states. And so one of the challenges we see from that historical legacy is courts and bureaucracies have to shoehorn people fleeing desperate circumstances into those historical definitions. So the mm. history and origins play out in very complex ways with changing circumstances today. I mean, I think you raise, we well, raise a number of important issues, but one of them that struck me is this idea that refugees aren't really a European problem. And yet often the understanding in Europe is that this is a huge problem here in the UK. This is a huge problem in, in Germany or wherever it may be. And actually, uh, I believe it's something like roughly 90% of refugees are living in developing countries. And I think Maya, just coming back to something you said that really stuck with me, the idea of sort of reframing the narrative or uh, you know, the way that we understand or misunderstand the whole notion of this refugee crisis. What do you think could be done to mitigate that or to, or to shift it back in a way that is closer to being true? So there's two things, I suppose, here, or maybe three. One is that, it, yes, in 2015, the summer of 2015 in particular, it's still referred to as the so-called European refugee crisis. And if you want to accept this crisis framing, I think it's not so much puzzling, but incredibly um, troubling uh, and in keeping with a, a much broader narrative that the crisis was framed as one for European states, as opposed to the people who were having to move, mm -hmm. the people who were having to make those journeys across the Mediterranean, many people dying in the process. Um, but I think the second thing is really understanding the historical context within which this has happened, so the more recent historical context, which is that Lucy Mayblin, who is one of my colleagues at Sheffield, has made a really compelling argument that actually some of this incredibly punitive policy that I spoke about earlier that we see really being introduced from the 80s onwards in countries like the UK and across um, Europe, which is things like stopping people from having the right to work whilst they are um, waiting on their asylum application, making it more difficult for people to sort of navigate the system, treating people in really, really terrible ways. And this sort of narrative around the bogus asylum seeker and the genuine refugee, she argues that you really see this come into play and these policies come into play when increasing numbers of people come from 
the so-called global south, so colonies and former colonies. And so she argues that actually there is a racialization within this debate, whereby it's people who are racialized as other, which are attached to these colonial hierarchies of who's human, who is not, that really, really shapes and pushes forward these punitive policies. And so when we're talking about asylum in the UK, at least, I think we can't escape that this debate is incredibly racialized. And so I think part of challenging this and sort of challenging the narrative is really getting to the root of those racialized discourses about who is seen to be a threat and who is not, who is seen to be genuine and who is not. And as, as Lucy Mabelin argues, that th this is tied to where people are coming from in the world and this being related to the UK and Europe's colonial past. You know, Danny, I want to shift gears for a moment because we can't have this conversation in this moment without acknowledging this global pandemic and the enormous implications of it across the board. I wonder if you could give us a sense of what the implications have been for the refugee crisis, what sort of changes or shifts you've seen, how you're responding to the unfolding crisis. Well, I think it is really important to recognise that the impact of COVID, especially on the poorest and most marginalised communities, including refugees, um, has been horrendous. You know, we estimate that more people will die at the end of this year because of hunger caused by disruption caused by COVID uh, than from the disease itself. And you know, it was brought home to me very powerfully by a, a text message a colleague received from a taxi driver in Nairobi early in the pandemic who said, this virus is going to starve us before it infects us. And I think that is the, the challenge we're seeing, you know, un, unpredicted uh, rises in, in levels of hunger and famine around the world. And in many parts of the world, if you take Yemen, for example, where already, you know, almost half the population was at risk of hunger, where there's a brutal civil war or conflict going on, COVID is a crisis on top of many other existing crises. And we really do, have to address uh, address you know immediate need and this is where it's so disappointing to see that levels of aid and assistance promised by Western governments just haven't been you know coming. In fact, we're worried that at the moment the levels of aid to places like Yemen have have gone down, not up. That the UN appeal for funding for provision in those Rohingya refugee camps is still largely unmet. Um, and so we want urgent action by, by governments and others to provide the resources to, uh, to meet this increasing and urgent need. I mean, you raise, you know, an important issue, which is, you know, does the West need to be doing more? Do governments need to be doing more or, or they should be doing more? And I wonder, Alexander, whether you feel sometimes, and this is, you know, an age old debate now, this tension between what sort of, uh, when you create this kind of need, right, and you create a kind of aid uh, situation, does does that become part of the problem when, um, you know, you have this constant cycle of reliance on aid and giving aid, and then it, this sort of keeps this power dynamic in this slightly imbalanced way? I just wonder if, how you feel about that. Yeah, I mean, as I tried to highlight earlier, 85% of the world's refugees are in low and middle income countries. Now, in certain parts of the world, like the Middle East, most are in cities now. The majority are living in urban areas. But in Africa, the majority continue to live in, in camps and refugee camps have become part of the way the world tries to protect refugees. Now, camps can be very important at the emergency phase. They're a way of distributing food, shelter, clothing, mm -hmm. meeting people's basic relief needs when they flee. But the problem is camps around the world often last five years, 10 years, 15 years, even longer. Children are born into camps, they become adults in camps. And we've seen what are called protracted refugee situations, where people get stuck in an intractable state of limbo, where camps like the Dadaab refugee camps, created in Kenya for Somali refugees in the early 1990s, continue to endure, despite being in inhospitable, arid border locations, which are very unsafe, where you've got people moving guns and weapons across the border and people get stuck without the right to work, without free freedom of movement. And that that's a tragedy. And one of the narratives we often hear is that that creates dependency. Camps mm -hmm. and long-term humanitarianism are not good for anyone. Now, what's important to recognize is that many refugees have vulnerabilities and we have to address them through ongoing humanitarian assistance. But they also have capabilities. They have skills, talents, aspirations, the ability to contribute. 
And for too long, we've seen refugees either as inevitably dependent or an inevitable burden on the receiving societies that host them. And it doesn't have to be that way. Refugees are very often capable of making contributions if they're empowered to do so. So the tragedy in many of those refugee hosting countries in poorer parts of the world, countries like Kenya, uh, countries like Tanzania, countries like Bangladesh, is they don't let refugees work. And so people mm -hmm. end up idle, without hope, and they resort, for instance, to using long journeys, dangerous journeys, as any person would, to try to improve what's available to them. Now, we've got to change that paradigm to recognise that wherever refugees are in the world, they can make a contribution if we let them, if we give them the chance to work, if we give them education, if we give them the chance to make those contributions, whether they be economic, social or cultural, we see that everywhere historically. The legacy of Vietnamese refugees resettled to the United States in the 1970s and 80s, the legacy of Bosnian refugees and Kosovan refugees across Europe, the legacy of Jews who fled the Holocaust, they have contributed to the United States, to Europe. And we see this now increasingly in Europe. Germany is realizing that Syrian refugees who arrived in 2015 and 16 are now making a contribution to the economy. So we can shift the focus from dependency to one of empowerment. Mm, and it's interesting you mentioned the camp because I think that is sort of the the paradigm of all of this. I mean, I know spending a lot of time in Lebanon, they won't allow them to build camps for Syrian refugees because the argument is that once you build a camp, you can't get rid of the camp and that the camp exactly, as you said, becomes a crutch. It's sort of feeding in to this paralysis of, of, of movement or this inability to, to, to move on to something different. I'm going to give each of you a minute. We've talked a lot about the sort of broader trends and what governments can be doing, what NGOs can be doing, what the media can be doing. But what can an individual sitting at home watching this, you know, well-intentioned, wanting to be a sort of productive member of the you know, humankind, how can they have some kind of a positive impact? What can they do to steer the conversation in a better direction. I think often for individuals, they hear this conversation and they're like, whoa, this is so big. I don't know where I fit in. So I'm gonna give each of you a minute. <laughs> I didn't say it was gonna be easy. And if you can just sort of synthesize, you know, what your suggestion would be to that individual right now, um, starting with you, Alexander. I feel lucky to be going first on this one. I mean, I would say um, learn, talk and engage. So people can become informed. There's a lot of information available out there. There are a lot of very good books like Maya's book that are accessible and engaging and provide an understanding of what's going on in our own country in the UK. So read a little bit, find out who refugees are, why they're in our communities. Then secondly, talk about it. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your parents. Don't be shy about reminding people that refugees are a particular group of people who have needs and rights under human rights law and international refugee law and so be able to start that debate in a way that might start within your household might then engage with people at your school or in your place of work and then before you know it that has a gradual effect on the attitudes people have their understanding and the way they relate to the refugee issue and then finally engage and that can be very local it doesn't have to be very global all communities in the uk have refugees Many have arrived recently, but a lot have been here for a very long time. So if you have those communities on your doorstep, find out about them. Engage with local NGOs who might be providing very basic sources of support, um, might be providing um, language clubs or basic access to classes. Go along, find out, get involved. Everybody has something they can offer to welcome people who are new or old to their community. So just crossing that boundary of speaking to someone different from yourself can offer you something and can contribute something back. When I started working with refugees, which is as a volunteer when I was 19, one of the things I expected to find was a sense of pity. I didn't, I found a source of inspiration and I learned far more than I was able to contribute. So that reciprocal engagement starting locally can be very powerful. Maya, your advice? This is all maybe going to be a bit repetitive. Um, I think my, 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 my advice, um, I mean, not that I have all the answers, but I think that something that I found through my own research is if you have some money, 
give it to an organization that you know is doing some of this work find those organizations in your local community or nationally or globally and if you've got the money they're going to need it increasingly you know i've spent the past um, few months interviewing some of these spaces some of these places that provide support for people they are overstretched more than ever they are understaffed they are going to go through an increasingly difficult time because of coronavirus so that's it's, it's definitely a time if you have the money which i know some people don't but if you do then i would give it but i think yes also going and getting involved i've been to so many of these um spaces across the country and what i find in a lot of them where the, eth the ethos is one that i can really identify with and agree with is that these are often not spaces of charity but solidarity and so i think going in with that mindset and going to spaces that is not only just strictly about supporting refugees but people who are undocumented migrants people who are trying to navigate the system these places that don't discriminate is incredibly important and yeah finally challenge these narratives wherever you find them you know these very pernicious narratives about integration and belonging they need to be really challenged the ideas that are perpetuated by our politicians a lot of them really really do need to be challenged whether as alexander says that at home whether it is in your workplace or whether it is engaging with more formal politics and challenging those politicians challenging some of those media organizations mm. don't give up on doing that because the change happens slowly and it's difficult sometimes to see how we're contributing to it but it is collective Danny, last but not least, your one minute of advice. I think be brave. I mean, this is a moment not just on refugee issues, but where Britain needs active, brave citizens to challenge discourses, to stand up and uh, when people tell lies and uh, and and stand up for refugees. And I, you know, and be brave because when I hear about Starbucks running a refugee training program or Bloomberg running a journalism program for refugees, or even Ben and Jerry's going out on social media and and challenging the Home Secretary about the rhetoric she's using. Those people who are behind all of those things were probably not refugee experts or people who are steeped in refugees. They were just people who think, I'm going to do something about, uh, about uh, this issue and help in whatever way I can. And I think that's where I find inspiration and I hope others do as well. Well, listen, all of you, I can't thank you enough for this conversation. I found it super fascinating. I've learned a lot. Alexander, Maya, Danny, thank you so much for your time. Thank you to the Imperial War Museum. And thank you, everybody who has tuned in for this important panel. That was Alexander Betts, Danny Sreskandaraja, Maya Goodfellow, and Clarissa Ward. The discussion over how the world can help refugees seems perhaps most relevant when we talk about vulnerable refugee children. Here's a short clip from Arwa Damon, senior international correspondent for CNN, talking about her work in the Middle East. There are images that are just completely seared into my mind. Still photographs almost, mostly of, of children's faces and of the way that the trauma of everything that they've been through just plays out on them. But most of the time when you come across these children in the war zones, they've just fled the violence. They've just been pulled out from underneath the rubble. They're shocked, they're traumatized. Her name's Mariam, she's 10 and there with her older sister, Inam. They say a mortar hit their house just as they were trying to make a run for it. One of the biggest challenges that we face when reporting on war zones or reporting on refugee crises is taking the intense, emotions and experiences that people have gone through and somehow trying to condense that into a news report and you know for myself and for a lot of my colleagues we're often left with this question of you know, did we do enough
The children on the refugee route, their parents have taken such risk to try to get them to what they believe is going to be this better life. They're exhausted. They've spent days and weeks on the road, sleeping out in the open, not knowing how they're going to be getting from, from one area to another. But at the same time, having actually left the, the physical war zone behind, you do begin to see little pieces of optimism. Of course, what they don't yet know is just how difficult all of that is going to be. It is heartbreaking to witness such despair. But I've also witnessed the power of kindness, of what it means to receive assistance, be it humanitarian, medical, or other forms of support. And whether it's coming from individuals or from charities that are operating around the world, the power of what's being provided, it's profound. Alleviating hunger, providing shelter, restoring dignity. And then there's what I see through my own charity, Inara, the impact of medical treatment. And what you begin to see, which is just so inspiring in so many ways, is this child's story, this child's psyche that was once so defined by violence and cruelty and evil, begin to shift. And when you see that shift, you realize the profound impact that we can have on one another when we do actually reach out and help each other. Their mother is in tears as she's talking about everything that they went through, but also about what the impact was of seeing her son being treated, seeing people actually stand with them and support them, and how it's given them the entire family actually hope again. The most painful thing with seeing children in war zones and on the refugee route, whether it's through my work at CNN or through my charity, Inara, is realizing that that spark inside a child's eye, that, that innocence, that joy, it's completely deadened. But it's not gone. It's something that can be restored. But it can only be restored when we actually come together. And if we do want to create better opportunities. If we want to be better, then we have to do better by those who need us the most. Oh, you <laughs> oh. And finally, we have something incredibly special as we near the end of our Refugee Nice Festival. Shingi Shuniwa is the former lead singer of the Noisettes, a band whose hit singles include Never Let Me Go and Don't Upset the Rhythm. Now pursuing a solo career, Shingi has just released a groundbreaking new album called Too Bold, a title which echoes her name in the Shona language. Shingi means be bold, be brave, have courage. I chatted briefly to Shingi about how being the child of Zimbabwean refugees has shaped her latest album. Hi Shingi. Hey, how are you doing? It's great to meet you. It's really wonderful and to meet you. And welcome to IWM London. Yeah. <laughs> Here we are. Fun. I haven't been here since I was probably on, on a school trip, so yeah. <laughs> well, it's great to have this you here. Different. And I would love to start by asking you about your personal connection with the issue of refugees. So, yeah, concerning migration and refugees, my parents were both um, forced to um, flee Rhodesia in the 70s during the brutal civil war, or during the brutal war that, that led to it becoming uh, Zimbabwe. They both fought in that war and both bore a lot of scars from that. However, they made uh, the best life that they could here. And so, um, yeah, I guess my kind of, um, I, my personality is uh, a mixture of um, my heritage, my Bantu heritage, and growing up in South London, which is where we are today. Yeah. 
my background and my heritage has only ever positively really enriched my creativity and um, my desire to make music, my desire to uplift, my desire to, um, you know, allow people to find hope and silver linings. Amazing. We, we were earlier just saying that how music is a universal language. Yes, it is. I, I told you about music in Syria where there was a huge music scene. Yeah. Um, rap, uh, rock, mm -hmm. um, underground. So we have the, the classical uh, musicians, but we also had these people who are coming from, you know, from the backstages mm. and performing incredible arts. And mm. unfortunately, now there's a diaspora, so there are <laughs> Syrians yeah. everywhere, but they, they took their music with them. Yeah. So, and I, I always find that in common with cooking and with art. <laughs> it's true. That's yeah. what we never leave. We exactly. always take it with us. <laughs> We're not leaving that. The spices and the rhythms. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you're about to, to perform a song. Yeah. War drums. Yes. What's the song about? So I guess, you know, the chorus is kind of saying, hard times, yeah, but we've seen it all before. Hard times, yeah, not running anymore. Pick yourself up off the floor. It's our time. It's kind of more, I think, the emotion that I want people to get from the song, which is, I know you guys have been through stuff. I've been through stuff a lot, and we're at such a peak time in world, world events. Mm. One could arguably say that we are living in, a re in revolutionary times, even though the revolution doesn't present itself in maybe the stereotypical Hollywood way that we think of revolution. <laughs> we are living in revolutionary times. And yeah. so, as an artist, I feel called upon to, to respond um, emotionally to what's going on around me and um, also to to show people that um, you know it's okay to express uh, the dark things in which we go through in order to find healing and there's a lot of commonality within that because a lot of people are going through things due to so many factors of the world events that we that, that I'm talking about yeah. so for me war drums is a call to action to say no more, I, you know, I just don't feel like conflict is the solution going forward. We're in a place where we can learn from what conflict yeah. has done. And most of the time it hasn't worked. It's caused misery, it's caused pain, it's caused scattering. For me, um, I was actually like really like nervous to come and perform in here because I just, I know that even my mum and my parents didn't talk so much about what they experienced during yeah. those times. They just wanted us to have a future and that's what they fought for. And I think we all want a great future for everybody Absolutely. going forward. Yeah. So stop banging on the war drums and um, because back in the day, the war drum was a common call in, uh, in not just African and Asian, but you see things like Thor, you've seen things yeah. like Game of Thrones. Yeah. The rhythm and the war is a, big, um, is a big klaxon call to say, do you want a battle? But I think that for me, to quote Grace Jones, this is my voice, <laughs> my weapon of choice, and my weapon is love, my weapon is art, and I want to do my little bit to, to fight for a better future for everybody. So that's why I'm going to sing War Drums, I'm going to drop a bit of Ghost Town, because that's the first time Amazing. I'm singing about use, losing a parent as a young age who never recovered from post-colonial trauma. Mm. So I'm going to be singing about that the first time in a building like this, which for years possibly subconsciously reminded of that trauma. And yeah. now I'm gonna turn that into something new, into something beautiful and find, do my best to find a silver lining for myself and my own relationship with whatever this building may represent. But ultimately I want people to know it's our time, no more war drums. Pick yourself up off the floor and that's why I'm going to perform those songs for you. And I'm delighted that we can end the festival in such an incredible and vibrant way. And I'm going to hand it over to you to close the night with war drums. Okay, enjoy the rhythms and I'm looking forward to learning about the, the spices as of course. well. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. for having me, Hassan. <laughs>
That's all from us. Thanks so much for joining the final episode in the IWM series Refugee Nights. We hope you enjoyed watching. If you did, please do come in and visit our refugee season when the museum reopens. There's lots more to watch on the IWM YouTube channel, so please make sure to like and subscribe. Special thanks as always to our sponsors McFarland, our partners AHRC and ESRC, and our media partner CNN. I am Hassan Akkad, and this is Refugee Nights. Goodbye from the Imperial War Museum in London.